Okay, Ruth, when you're ready. Okay. Right, okay. Um, welcome to this month's uh, APPP Walking and Fights meeting. Uh, I'm Ruth Sibri, MP, one of the two co-chairs of the APPG. Uh, Selene Sackley is not able to be with us today. So, um, as we all know, it's one thing to talk about more walking and cycling, but it's another thing to know that we're actually making a difference uh, and whether what 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 ideas make the most difference. So I've got three speakers today who are going to start um, the unpicking of, of that key uh, of that key question. Um, we're particularly looking at good practice that can be rolled out uh, across the country, across the UK. Um, we'll be hearing from Andy Kremen, who's from Cycling UK, uh, about the Big Bike Revival Project. So that's obviously just about cycling. We've got Alice Roberts from uh, the Healthy Streets Scorecard, which is a London initiative. And we've got Dean Stevens from Sustrans on the Walking and Cycling Index. Uh, and can I just please remind participants to put questions in the Q&A box, uh, not the chat box, because I can't, uh, Adam Kaufman and I can't monitor both at the same time. So each of the speakers have 10 minutes and then we'll head straight away um, to Andy. Okay, let me just unmute, sorry about that. Um, I've got some slides to share, so hopefully this will bear with me two seconds and I shall see if I can get that to share. There we go, can, can we see slideshow or is that the, yeah, you can see that. Um, let me just check. Okay, cool. So my name's Andy. Yeah, so I'm from I'm the head of behaviour change and development for Cycling UK uh, in England, and I'm just going to talk to you um, about our main program that we use in terms of behaviour change is our Big Bite Revival program. So I've got a few slides to show. Um, I'm going to talk generally about the program and a little bit around uh, some of the monitoring and data and, and how the program works as well. So, yep. so the aim of the Big Bike Revival is to target non-regular cyclists, um, those that are starting to cycle and returning cyclists, with the aim of increasing cycle trips, uh, improving confidence, and really the ultimate goal of the chain, uh, achieving modal shift. So the programme has been funded by the Department for Transport in, uh, since 2014, uh, and it's funded nationally, so we work across England. Uh, and it came from the idea that there's surveys done that there was 43% of people had a bike in the shed, but it wasn't um, roadworthy. And so the first in iteration of the program was about essentially delivering basic cycle maintenance to those bikes, so doctor bike type activity. Uh, since then, the program has grown uh, and, and adapted as we go. We're going to kind of talk through that a little bit. So how does it work? Uh, in essence, it is uh, a grant scheme. So Cycling UK funds uh, multiple community focused organizations across England to deliver the program. They apply to us for grants um, and then deliver a series of one-off events in their local communities across uh, the country. So the scale of the program uh, has increased year on year. I think during lockdown, um, we were lucky enough to have an increase in funding. The aim of sort of capitalizing on the, the boom in cycling that came through and kind of as an alternative to the, the, the voucher scheme that was issued uh, through bike shops. The idea being this was much more community focused and we were bringing uh, the cycle maintenance perhaps to the people that wouldn't necessarily go into cycle uh, bike shops. This year, uh, it's a £2 million programme, again, funded by the Department for Transport. Um, and it's returning to kind of our standard model, which I'll talk to in a second. During lockdown, we were able to adapt the programme to work under lockdown conditions uh, and social distancing. So 
that was a big scale up in the probe, but it was a lot more return to deliver Dr. Bikes. So as I said, we, we worked with, last year we worked with over 300 delivery organizations uh, delivering the program. And it's, it's run through a core team of staff that we have, but also through a network of our cycling development officers that we have across the country. So working, so from south to north, uh, we have an officer in Plymouth and, and the southwest, the southeast, so they're covering kind of Sussex uh, and Hampshire kind of uh, area. Then we have Kent, Essex, Suffolk, Norfolk, um, and then the next one across would be the West Midlands. So that's um, to Wolverhampton uh, and, and Dudley and Sandwell. And then we've also got Birmingham itself. Then we have the East Midlands, which is sort of Derby, Nottingham and Leicestershire. Uh, then we have an officer in Sheffield, um, West Yorkshire, Liverpool City region, Blackpool, Manchester and Tyneside and that northeastern pocket. So, as I said before, it started with this idea that it was just about fixing, uh, getting bikes up and running, the idea of overcoming one of those barriers to cycling. As the programme's developed, we've realised that there's more to it, obviously, than just cycle ownership and having a, a roadworthy bicycle to use. So, using our in-house uh, behavioural scientists that we have, we're taking uh, a view, looking at the programme through a behavioural science lens and the idea of sort of making sure that the programme works in the best possible way and it gives an effective intervention. So the programme now runs on what we call our fixed learn ride model with each of those elements working towards the COM-B model of behaviour change. So providing capability, increasing capability to cycle through our learn type events, which could be uh, learn to ride or learning about cycle maintenance yourself. Then we're also providing opportunity to cycle through that fixed element, so the, the regular kind of doctor bike type activity. And then we are also improving motivation for cycle, providing led ride type activity and social rides for people so that they can go on and build social bonds through cycling which is really important i think when we're talking about this level the aspiration is to get towards active travel but at this initial phase it may be the, the drivers we've decided are more um, around social aspects around cycling and again as we develop our program uh, year on year it's about more about empowering our partners and our local communities to be able to deliver this uh, effective interventions. So again, as I said, we the behaviour change theory is now kind of embedded. We do a lot of work, training and support to our delivery partners to help them create the best interventions. And again, it's a two-way process. We're using their, we have delivery partners that work this year on year and using their feedback to help develop the programme. And then when we say about developing the program, obviously the, the groups we work with, we can provide training and support around the specifics around you know, how to do some of the cycle maintenance, et cetera. But what we're really talking about is giving them the tools around behavior change. So we spent a, lot, a long period over the last year with our team, really distilling everything down into a behavior change through a behavior change lens. So our team have worked with our uh, development officer staff, delivery partners, but also beneficiaries to really drill down into what they think is a, makes a successful type of event. And then we've created a series of resources to help the delivery partners deliver these events. And here's just a couple of examples of the resources there, one for each of the types of events. And it's not about, it's not teaching delivery partners to, uh, you know, teach them to suck eggs, I guess is the term. It's about making the sort of triggers in terms of behavior change work best at the event. So small advice on how they can improve it. And then the next sort of element of that is our behavior change read, um, behavior change cards, which was a sort of a novel invention that we that our team came up with last year. It's almost like a game of top trumps, but again, bringing everything through a behavior change lens. So we've delivered these activities with our delivery partners. And it's getting them to think about the motivations and the reasons why they do the events. So we know they, you know, they know how to fix a bike or run a bike ride, but this is about 
getting them to think about the deeper um, logic behind it, what will actually get someone to change their behavior. So we're, we're rolling those out at the moment with our delivery partners. Um, and it's something we started at the end of last year. This something that's rolling through, will be sort of peppered through our program through this year. So if I just move on, so that's kind of how we do it. And here's just a couple of examples. As I said, <clears throat> the stories are often the most powerful, I guess, from our programs. So here's just a couple of um, case studies uh, that we have. So again, this is from our delivery partner in Nottingham called Women in Tandem. And this is Dion, who took part in a women's only session about um, uh, basic cycle maintenance and checking. So again, she found the session really helpful, but I think what's useful here is that the impact that the programs had in terms of her cycling activity. So obviously now she feels much more confident about fixing a bike, which is now encouraging her to use the cycle more and to start to use it for work. She's also mentioned that the cost has been a real barrier to cycling, especially now as the cost of living um, increases. And now she's actually using it as a method of transport. So yeah, as you said, the cost of fuel is becoming a real problem. She now cycles to work on a regular basis as a result of the intervention. Um, and also what was particularly appealing to Dion in these settings was that it was a women only environment. Um, and that reduced some of those barriers that she might have felt um, in a mixed group. As a consequence of joining that, she's now also joined some of the lead ride activities. Um, and it said, and in fact, the lead ride ended up being perhaps longer than we would normally do. So it was 17 miles. Um, and she's really sort of found a sense of reward in terms of that as well. And she continues to go on more of those rides now. Um, and she said, what it's really helping with, with is building that confidence to be able to cycle independently as she goes on. And there we go. One more case study here, just an example. So this is Ginny. So she's from our delivery partner at Ready Steady Pedal up in Bailden, up in uh, Greater Manchester. And this is a real example of how um, cycling has benefited her in terms of uh, mental health as well as physical. So as you said there, so she's been a full-time carer for her husband um, and then needed to find a new sense of purpose and activity that made her feel good and that she could do with her children and grandchildren but also thinking about that physical, mental well-being uh, and related to sort of hypertension and weight problems. But she said, yeah, so she's grew up, cycled a long time ago, like uh, in the 1970s and life got involved and, you know, she cycled less and less and the big bike revival gave her that sort of nudge to return to it a bit more. Uh, she said, you know, younger she was confident but then life got in the way and then in terms of where she was living in Bradford she felt it was wasn't safe uh to cycle um <clears throat> yeah and then so she took part in the playground based women's only cycling sessions and the, that would have been one of our learn events so confidence building in an off-road safe welcoming environment and then as she's taken part in that uh, those sort of one-off sessions, she then started to take part in lead rides that went on-road and off-road using sort of local infrastructure. And as you said, the impact for her and those first sessions, she ended up walking to the sessions, but then by the end, she was starting to ride home after the sessions, and then eventually she was cycling there. She feels physically stronger um, and mentally it's given her a boost, which she feels like is sustained over the week between the sessions. So again, confidence is boosting and she's starting to take up independent cycling. So just to give you a quick outline now in terms of how we monitor. So in terms of monitoring and evaluation, we do survey-based monitoring and evaluation. So beneficiaries on the programme filling a survey at baseline at the point of intervention. So they may attend a doctor bike type fix event or a lead ride or a learn session. And we use that we uh, contact them and they fill in surveys around ethnicity but also around uh, and demographics but also around their attitudes towards cycling and their cycling levels they we are then contacting them 12 weeks later for a follow-up survey and measure the impact 
So this information here just kind of gives you a headline, uh, some of the base stats from this, so last year's program, 2021-22. Um, in terms of our ethnicity, so we had nearly 20% that were non-white. We also had um, good levels of female uh, participation in the program compared to cycling as a whole. Um, and then again, we have good representation from the lower, lower socioeconomic groups that would be traditionally associated with cycling as well. So we are reaching, this comes through sort of being a local based or uh, activity that's reaching group areas where sort of traditional cycling activity perhaps wouldn't normally and then and then we have our 40 percent non-regular cyclists when they attend uh, their first sort of event at baseline and then for follow-up we can see that we've got increases in cycling levels so we had 77,000 new trips created um, then we had a, an increase in people moving from non-regular to regular cy cycling, as reported in their follow-up survey 12 weeks after that intervention. And also a 50% reduction in car trips. And that is based on the sort of the survey findings of how do they how beneficiaries would normally travel for a series of journeys and then comparing that against a uh, follow-up question. And so the, the decline in the number of car trips taken. Um, in terms of beneficiaries, we had over 80,000 beneficiaries reached uh, last year. And so that's reporting. We, we're getting to the sort of kind of scale now where the intervention becomes statistically significant. Um, and just sort of some other initial kind of findings from last year um, was based on some more survey data in our post follow-up survey was 28% um, of beneficiaries had an intention to change some of their journeys from car to cycling. And that was evident after 12 weeks as well. So it proves that I think that the, the programs, the interventions they took part in does provide some sustained behavior change. Obviously it does drop off over time as we know, but it does show there is a legacy from the program. I think for us, we would like to be able Andy, to. Can you, can, Andy? Sorry, could you make your final remarks? Because uh, yep. So that was it. Yes, yeah, so we'd like to continue that uh, and look at for, lo for increased longer term monitoring uh, and evaluation that will come through longer term funding. That was it. In essence, whistle stop tour. Sorry for overrunning, but yeah, I've got to see any questions. I'm happy to. Okay. Well, um, if people, as I say, could put their questions in the Q and A. That would be great. Okay, now over to um, Alice Roberts from the Healthy Streets Scorecard. If you could say a little bit about, you know, where you, um, you know, uh, who you work for or what you are, and um, and about then, then of course, obviously about the scorecard. That would be great. Thank you very much. Uh, you're on mute, Alice. So I should be now off mute. I'm just trying to make my slideshow play. So let's see if we can do that. So is that okay? Um, yep. Okay, so the Healthy Streets Scorecard is a London project. Um, we're a coalition. I'm from CPRE London, which is the campaign to protect rural England. Uh, the London branch, which might seem a little bit odd, but um, I will hopefully explain why that is. Um, I chair the coalition, I coordinate it. Um, we have somebody who works on it part time, but it's, uh, there's a lot of volunteer effort that, involve, that is involved in this as well. So you can see the partners there. Um, the coalition came, around, came about in around 2018 when uh, the mayor's transport strategy was coming out. Um, and specifically, we were um, very excited to see the target within the transport strategy to shift um, for mode shift, so to reduce car trips from roughly six, sorry, roughly 40% of trips to 20% uh, of trips. Um, and we knew that um, without the boroughs taking strong action, that that wasn't going to happen. So boroughs in London control 95% of the roads. Um, obviously, we have, a, we have a very different situation to the rest of the country, but, um, but we still knew that the boroughs would have to do an awful lot to make that happen. Um, 
Yeah, so what we did was we created what we call the scorecard, an annual scorecard where we give boroughs scores on various things. Um, and this year we just published in July, at uh, the beginning of July, we just published the, um, the, uh, the fourth scorecard. So, um, so today I'm, I'm going to kind of go over the, the scores, but I just wanted to, to say briefly why, um, you know, to, just in the context of London, it was incredibly important to have that mode shift target. And, um, and obviously things do work in the rest of the country, but I just feel like, you know, if we, if we hadn't had that, everything would be a huge amount harder. Um, and, and it's under, you know, it underpins the London plan as well. So the, the planning framework for London and, there's a particularly important um, policy in that, which is um, that all new development should be zero car as a starting point. That means there should be no parking spaces and the expectation should be that the, that the people in that should not be able to uh, get a parking permit. Um, obviously, that rather assumes that, that parking is controlled. Um, but, uh, but I just wanted to make that point because the links, obviously, between having um, a transport plan um, and, a and, a, and a local plan and a planning, land use planning framework, which actually work together is, um, is vitally important. Um, so yeah, so the, there were some big changes this year, which were really interesting. So I'm just gonna mention them, um, but I'll also go through some of the results, not all of them for some various reasons. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so this, is, this is the, the sustainable mode share in all of the London boroughs. So just to give you an idea of what we publish. So um, you can see that the, the pale yellow is in the London boroughs and dark, sorry, did I say yellow? Blue, light blue, <laughs> it's the heat. Um, light blue is in the London, dark blue is out of London. And you can see that even within the inner London boroughs, there's a really, there's a really big difference there. So yeah, there's huge, um, huge opportunities for improvement, um, but every borough is different. So which indicators did we choose? Well, we, we choose different indicators. So, so we have what we call input indicators, and those are the things that boroughs can do, um, which will help to deliver mode shift, um, but they will also help to deliver two other important targets. And one is of active travel rates. So we measure that as well, and we publish that too. Um, and also Vision Zero, which is um, eliminating serious road deaths and serious injuries. Um, and so all of these, uh, the intention is that they, they contribute as a whole to these, um, all these targets and they're things that boroughs can do um, and that they just mainly require political will. They are um, financially um, things that we think that can happen, um, particularly things like low traffic neighbourhoods, pound for pound for pound uh, deliver um, a huge change um, as against other inputs or measures, I suppose. Uh, this year, we were very excited to introduce a new input measure, which is bus priority. So we're promoting uh, bus priority in London on bus routes. That means basically putting in bus lanes or bus gates, um, which is where only bus is allowed through, not general traffic. Um, and the other inputs that we promote, 20 mile per hour, we promote, I suppose, and measure for every borough. Um, proportion of streets which are 20 mile per hour, proportion of streets which have controlled parking zones, uh, proportion of the whole area which is suitable for a low traffic neighbourhood, um, i.e. we remove things like very big parks um, or green spaces, um, and then proportion of roads which have cycle track, and then we have proportion of streets which have a school street where traffic is not able to go through at um, arrival and departure times, and also school stars, which promotes active travel, uh, sustainable travel to school. So the outcome indicators are, first of all, sustainable mode share, but then also active travel, as I said, serious road injuries and deaths. And this and car this and we've always published car ownership. Um, data, but this year we introduced something new, which was we introduced an element of that indicator, which is how the proportion of polluting vehicles, primarily diesel cars. So um, now I can't see what I'm looking at. Overall results. So sorry, that's the overall results. Um, right. So that gives you an idea of you know. So who comes top? Who comes bottom? And that's um, again. You know, we see that some. Uh, outer London boroughs doing very well, doing even better than inner London boroughs. 
Um, you've got Islington, Hackney, Camden at the top there. City of London, obviously, is a bit of an outlier, but um, does very well. Down at the bottom, Hillingdon, Buckingham, Dagenham, Redbridge, Bexley, Havering and Sutton. Um, so we also this year did something quite interesting, which was we adjusted for density because we know that um, inner London boroughs have a natural advantage, if you like. Um, and then we looked at which one's doing better if you adjust for density. And the really interesting one there is Wolf and Forest, which is an outer London borough, which has done a huge amount to introduce um, uh, low traffic neighborhoods, cycle track in particular. Um, so yeah, so uh, that, that was really interesting. And if you look right at the bottom there, you've got Tower Hamlets, who's very inner London borough, um, doing much worse than you'd expect. So, um, so that gave us a bit of an insight as well and gives boroughs an insight too, and residents, which is key. So the big changes, well, very interesting, decline in car ownership, particularly in some boroughs which have done a lot to introduce um, the kind of measures that we're talking about. Um, and then we've seen a big, uh, a big growth in school streets. So car ownership, the decline was in almost every single borough, apart from strangely Tower Hamlets, um, but also Hillingdon. Hillingdon already has a, a huge number of cars. Tower Hamlets has very low car ownership, but it's um, it has uh, percentage wise that um, it has increased the number of cars uh, registered in the borough. So yeah, look at that, Newham 4% and Southwark 3.7%, really interesting. And the really interesting one, of course, is Waltham Forest there which is an outer London borough where you really wouldn't expect it to be um, to be one of the biggest drops of all of, of all London boroughs. So something like 38, oh, sorry, uh, 38,000 cars altogether. Um, so this brings in um, the spatial issues, which is something that CPI London are particularly interested in. Um, 64 football pitches worth of space. And that's just the ones, the, car, the, the, the cars that we've lost. So that's 1.5% overall in London, car ownership dropped. Um, so you can imagine the amount of space that gets taken up by cars otherwise. So yeah, so the CPRE London has a particular interest in spatial issues. Um, we also more generally have an issue around um, uh, compact cities, if you like. So uh, the opposite of urban sprawl uh, would be a compact city. And obviously we're, we're very, um, conscious about saving countryside and promoting green belts and um, and so we promote compact city and we know that compact cities don't work if you don't uh, have sustainable transport um, and also if you build out into the green belt you uh, you end up building car dependent low density car dependent development so so that's the link between planning if you like and transport so growth in school streets that was very exciting that went up from two percent two years ago to 15 percent now so that's a bit of a, um, yeah, a, a huge rise. So that's all very exciting. And, and, and it gives school streets are things that we find boroughs can do when, when they struggle really with the kind of really strong measures like um, low traffic neighbourhoods. They find it um, easier to put in school streets. Um, so, so that's been really exciting. Um, 20 mile per hour uh, has also um, been something that boroughs, which I guess originally um, weren't doing a great deal, have focused on 20 mile per hour, which is great because, um, you know, we, we don't expect every borough to do everything, but we do know that every borough can do something. And so 20, putting in a 20 mile per hour default speed limit does push them up the rating pretty, pretty good, pretty well. Um, this year, we've, we've literally mapped every bus route in London. And, and obviously London is different. Um, we have, you know, if you like regulated buses and, um, so we mapped uh, the proportion of each bus route that has a bus lane or is go through a low traffic neighbourhood where it has priority. Um, and again, we've, we've just got these really dramatically different results. So um, the really interesting one here is if you look right down at the bottom, Kensington and Chelsea with just 5%, that's an inner London borough. Um, but the, look at that Hackney up there at 50%. Um, so yeah, outer, or outer London, obviously much lower, but again, quite big differences. So yeah, low traffic neighborhoods, huge differences now. Hackney's up there with 70% of its of, of suitable area. Um, so not parks and big green spaces, 
um, covered by a low traffic neighbourhood um, and down at the bottom there, 4%. Um, and of course, low traffic neighbourhoods have just such a dramatic impact on, um, on mode shift. So stopping people from taking short trips, but also promoting walking and cycling. Um, so that's the kind of, that's the data, if you like. So quite a lot of movement the last year. So you can see that's year on year, but sorry, that's 2020 to 2022, quite a lot of movement there. Um, protected cycle track, um, <clears throat> again, big differences, wolf and forest. So is the, is the top. So we wouldn't expect them this to look like 100%. Um, but 13% is very, very good. And it's an outer London borough, which is really amazing. Um, the only other borough is City of London, which does better, I think. Kensington and Chelsea, naught percent. So um, here we have the figures, protected cycle track. We can see some boroughs creeping up, doing very well, quite a few, quite low down there. Um, 20 mile per hour speed limits. We now have 19 boroughs with a default 20 mile per hour speed limit, um, but notably um, a, a large number which haven't, haven't taken this measure yet. So Barnet and Bromley there, uh, with just, sorry, with just 5% of streets. Um, control parking zones is, um, you know, we've got a number of boroughs now in London, so five boroughs there with 100%, so total coverage, um, but there's Bromley there with only just 8%, and, um, and I think, you know, thinking about parking is, is, is one of the things that I do an enormous amount of and myself. I've um, created a kind of benchmark assessment tool for local authorities to look at their parking policies to see how they can support mode shift and um and i think you know a lot of people say oh well we're bromley you know we don't need you know control parking we're different out here but i was actually speaking to somebody recently who lives relatively near to the town center and she said she said oh no people come and park in our street and then walk into town even if they you know even if it's 20 minute walk they will do that um and i think you know really we have to we have to get on top of control parking if we want to stop those short trips it's an absolute fundamental. Um, so school uh, school provision, school streets, as I said, is is up, but a huge difference between boroughs. So Forty nine percent of schools in Islington now have a school street, so that's fantastic. Um, but but really, some boroughs doing very little or nothing at all, um, and that's really you know really um, not great. Um, school provision so we also uh there, sorry those are the figures again so big range huge range um and then the school oh, hang on. stars so stars is the scheme where you can um where you can promote sustainable travel to school and um and what's nice about this is you've seen some boroughs barnet and bromley for instance up the top there which don't really score very well on other things um they've got a few points there so that's great I'm um, in a bigger, much bigger mix between inner and outer there. Um, so outcome indicators. This year we didn't update most of the indicators because the, the data related to um, lockdown years. So the data was um, uh, just a big mess, basically. You know, we, we don't really know what the outcomes are yet. So we couldn't, uh, we couldn't um, update sustainable mode share, active travel rates, um, uh, casualty rates, but we did update um, Car ownership, as I said, I've talked a bit about that, and we added in the, the polluting vehicles. So we've got now the proportion of diesel there, you can see in the dark blue at the bottom in each borough. And, um, and that help, you know, that helps to promote policies like diesel surcharges for parking permits, things like that. Um, yeah, so um, the, the yeah, so that's that's really it. I mean, I think just to kind of say, well, does it work <laughs> in the sense, does it? help to promote um, these measures. Um, and I think there's a, there's a lot of evidence to show that it is promoting um, action. Uh, partly, you know, we are seeing increases in all of the indicators. Um, we're seeing, for instance, um, Richmond has jumped up the table and, and actually a councillor from Richmond spoke at the launch and said that, you know, that he had actually, you know, looked at the scorecard in 2020 and, and you know, they are, definitely you know concerned about being low low down in the in the overall scores um but also you know it works on a number of levels and it we know that councillors and councils do worry about where they are on our scorecard they ask us questions about it throughout the year 
Um, and, um, and we work with something like 350 local campaign groups and individuals now around London who are linked to our members, our coalition members, but also just groups who are popping up themselves. Um, and they work to promote it as well at local level. So, so yeah, we, you know, we do think that we're, we're having an impact. And certainly this year, I think um, one of the councillors who spoke at the launch said, you know, if, if you don't measure it, it won't happen. And, um, and, they, and all the councillors who spoke said that their boroughs were certainly um, looking closely at the results each year now, which is fantastic. Yeah, so there you go. That's brilliant. Thank you, Alice. Um, we are running over, but it's been very interesting. Um, but can I move on to Dean Stevens from uh, Sustrans uh, talking about the walking and cycling in depth? Okay, thank you. Um, let me just see if I can uh, get the slideshow happening. Okay, hopefully you can see that now. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Dean Stevens from SAS Trans, um, I'm Programme Manager for our Walking and Cycling Index, um, which uh, used to be known as Bike Life um, until 2021, um, but we now collect a lot more data on walking as well, so we've changed the name. So, um, first of all, I'll just give you an overview of what the, what the programme's about. Then I'll touch on um, some of the key messages that came out of the 2021 uh, results. Uh, then uh, run through some of the other statistics from the program and then just touch on some of the future developments that we're working on. So, um, yeah, what is it? It's, uh, it's a, an assessment of walking, wheeling and cycling. Um, so we gather uh, what we hope is a broadly comprehensive collection of uh, data in, and it was 18 cities in 2021. Um, began in 2015 as Bike Life, runs every two years. So 2015, 17, 2019 as Bike Life, and then this time round as Walking and Cycling Index. Um, okay, so um, what's in it? The bases of the data, um, the first section, uh, city data, which is kind of the supply side, or if you like, uh, the inputs, as, um, as Alice referred to them. So um, things, it's about partly about provision, but it's also about some of the other things that determine the environment that people find when they're walking or cycling. So cycle theft and collisions are in there as well. Um, then there's, uh, yeah, also to, you, to use Alison's, Alice's language there about outputs. Um, yeah, some of those are behave people's behaviours, so they're in there. Um, and also we use the behaviour data together with other data to model estimates on the amount of walking and cycling that are happening um, and on the health and environmental and economic benefits and so on. Um, and then there's also a, a large bundle of data on people's attitudes um, to walking, cycling, uh, sustainable travel. Um, that go into uh, the reports that we produce. So the actual um, outputs that come from the programme, the core outputs have been um, a, a PDF report, which you can find if you uh, just go to Sustrans uh, website and look up Walking and Cycling Index. Um, so it's been, uh, it's for 2021, it was a 24 page report on each of those 18 cities or city regions, um, as well as the data, the reports include case studies. So there's six case studies in each city. So over a hundred altogether, um, which can be used for, for helping to make, make the case as it were um, in various ways. Uh, and city information. So that's some, um, uh, an explanation from each of the partner authorities that we work with in those 18 places to describe uh, what they've achieved since the last round of reports and what they're planning in the, in the near future. So, um, and in that, uh, amongst the data, there's, there's questions on the types of things that work to go back to the sort of the original premise that, that Ruth set out for, the, for this meeting. Um, so there is information there on the kind of things that people say would help them to, to walk or cycle more. Um, yeah. So what's new for 2021? Well, one thing maybe just to pick up um, from those conversations was uh, that the, 
the attitude survey that we run, which is uh, representative in all of the in each of the cities. Um, we did delay that slightly in 2021 compared to previous so that it was conducted um, after any travel requirements had been ceased, any COVID related travel requirements. So we ran the survey in July, uh, July, uh, yeah, July, August and September. Um, so just uh, other things perhaps to say about sort of the overall um, premise of the programme is that uh, we're working in these cities and city regions at that, that geographical level. So through that, we intend to provide data which is at a, um, a fairly strategic level and reflects the, the geographical level at which more strategic decisions are made. So it complements the data that you get from the monitoring and evaluation of individual interventions. Um, and also important, of course, that the, the attitude survey is, is representative of the population as a whole, not just people that are um, already cycling or even already walking. Um, and also we uh, ensure that, well, obviously the same, the same questions are used in each of the cities in the survey. And for the other measures, things like um, the calculation of the, the total length of cycle routes, et cetera, we use the same definition in all the cities. So it's possible for one city to benchmark themselves against others. Okay, so there's a few things that were new in 2021, a lot more information on walking wheeling. Um, and uh, also we were able to bring in a lot more this time uh, from GIS, geospatial sources, um, around things like pavement widths and so on. Okay. Um, we also aggregate the data from the 17 UK cities and produce a, a, an aggregate UK report. So some of the data that I'll run through um, in a couple of minutes is from that aggregate report. Um, Dublin's not included, partly because it's outside the UK, but also because um, the survey was conducted face to face there. In the UK cities, it's done um, through a method called push to online, which is a combination of online paper responses so certain respondents get the opportunity to use use either and that's just helps ensure that it's uh, representative okay so um the some of the key messages or a couple of the key messages from 2021 um one is i mean it's something that we've seen before with cycling but this time of course we covered walking in a lot more detail with the questions that we asked um, and one of the things that was clear from a, a, a bundle of the questions in our survey and the responses we had um, were that um, there are groups, demographic groups, um, disabled people, people on low incomes too, that probably stood out most, um, who feel, feel less welcome when walking or wheeling in their neighbourhood. Um, that's compared to 65% was the figure for the overall population in, in all the cities, all those 17 cities. Um, but that's reflected in some of the other questions as well around perception of safety, for example. 52% um, of people saying it's safe for children to walk in their area. We did also ask in each of the cities at what age people felt that it was safe for um, children to walk and cycle locally independently. Um, and that, a, that average age does, of course, vary from one city to another. So you can see that in the reports. Um, perceptions of cycling safety improved um, quite markedly. Um, reasons for that, possibly, you can, we, we can only speculate, but um, because in the pandemic, perhaps more people went out and tried uh, cycling. Um, obviously, there is good work going on. Um, uh, for example, the... Um, Cycling UK scheme that was described, lots of things happening, which are gradually having effects. So perceptions of cycling safety are improving. Um, the third of those bullet points there is about the percentage of households within 125 metres of the types of cycle route that most people would consider reasonably safe. Um, so we use that as a more objective measure of uh, the quality of cycle safety for cycling. Um, so it doesn't include things like just painted cycle lanes, which is just generally thought not to be satisfactory. So um, moving on to some charts and some other trends in the data. Um, walking, the, we asked about how frequently people use each of the main modes of transport, walking, cycling, 
driving and public transport. And so we're comparing here between uh, the summer of 20 or spring of 2019 and later spring going into summer 2021. Um, and whilst the level of or the, the frequency of people regularly using public transport dropped quite a lot, um, you know, as we might perhaps have, have expected, of course, by then, um, level of driving was also down a long way, whereas the levels of walking um, held up pretty much. Um, and the levels of cycling um, had uh, were different from one city to another. But one of the important things there was that if you measure it by the percentage of people that use a mode of transport five days a week, there are more people now that walk five days a week than drive. And that didn't used to be the case in 2019. So yeah, just a bit of a tipping point there in some, in some respects reached. So cycling, that one's about cycling uh, once a week or more. Um, so some increases there, but not across the, not across all the cities. Um, and then also with people who ever uh, use a cycle of any kind, various kinds of cycle. Um, some bigger increases seen in that. So uh, hopefully we take that as a sign that there are more people that were not cycling before that have now um, experimented with it, tried it out again recently, um, dusted off their cycle, you know, as, as we were hearing. Um, so those figures are showing some good trends. Um, number of annual cycling trips, um, there's some ups and downs across the, uh, across the cities. Um, perceptions of cycling, cycling safety, so that just shows in more detail there um, that there was an increase of, well, more than 3% in all of our, uh, well, that's a clutch of 13 cities, which is the ones that we we're able to make comparisons with between 2019 and 2021. We've got a few new cities in the programme um, for 2021 as well. Um, public support appeared to have fallen for some of, for well, most of the measures when we take it at face value in terms of just asking the question, do you support um, more physically protected cycle tracks protected by a curb? Um, but having said that, so figures similar for school streets there, um, but having said that, then we also saw decreases in the percentage of people that um, would support all sorts of um, transport related intervention, including um, the percentage of people that agreed with spending more on driving went down as well. So this may just be a reflection that um, people are looking for public spending more in some other areas rather than transport. And um, so, yep, similar story for low traffic neighbourhoods, although it's not always a decrease. Um, some increases and um, the, the figures are perhaps not as dramatic as we might have feared from some of the, uh, the news stories that we've seen on low traffic neighbourhoods. And important to say that those figures were all the percentage of people that, that support the types of measures that we advocate. Um, but there's a lot of people that are you know, don't know or say that they don't hold a strong opinion. So when you actually look at people that are uh, say they specifically oppose um, active travel measures, they are pretty low, um, including for low traffic neighbourhoods and, and importantly for school streets as well down there, um, where the, the level of support isn't quite as high as we would like, but it's still a majority, 51% and a small proportion disagree. So, um, yeah, I mentioned about support for investment, more investment in more modes of travel. Now, all of those four figures have gone down compared to 2019. But what, um, you know, what we would say is important is that the figure uh, for driving is much lower than for the others, um, much higher levels of support for more spend on uh, walking, cycling and public transport. So we've had good media coverage when we published the 2021 reports back in, um, in May, and we're doing some extra work um, to develop this net. There's a whole load of data that doesn't reach it into the reports. Um, that you see when you go and um, you go and look at those or download those from Sustrans website. So we are working to develop a, a dashboard so people can explore the data in a lot more detail. So, for example, you would be able to look at um, different demographic groups, um, the views of, say, women in particular, the views of disabled people in particular, 
um, and we'll be looking to it, or launch it in October or being well and expand it um, and bring in new functionality as time goes by. Um, yeah, a bit more detail on that. And we also are busy with um, what's called disabled citizens inquiry on walking and wheeling. So to explore that more through um, focus groups and other um, forms of forms of inquiry um, and to produce some other uh, types of report looking at particular themes um, from the data that we gather. Um, so yeah, just to reiterate, recap on probably the key messages that we have from this, this uh, 2021's collection of data um, was that, um, that there are equality issues around, um, particularly around walking and making the streets safer. So that just, yeah, pe more people feel more equally welcome and safe on their streets. Um, there are, um, amongst the measures that we surveyed that would enable, help people to walk more, um, was less pavement clutter. So um, along with the, the other organisations that Sustrans is allied with, of course, we continue to call for um, some, some action around um, pavement parking in particular. Uh, and then finally, yes, that point about the fact that a majority of people would like to see more investment um, in making walking um, at least a better experience, not necessarily increasing the level of walking, but just improving the, the quality, if not the quantity of walking. And, that, and that's compared with the support for uh, more investment in driving. So I think um, that is uh, about all I wanted to uh, to say on that so thank you for listening okay, that's great thank you thank you very much dean and, and thank you also to alice and andy um we, we are running um short of our allocated hour but i've been told by adam that we're not going to be thrown out, out of the system at, at half past so if people want to stay they're very welcome to you um speakers have helpfully been answering uh questions that have come in um and because i'm the chair and because i'm work out how I can put in a question I'm going to ask a couple so um Alice you, you're you're very uh, pro the rollout of more uh, residence parking schemes and 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 restricted parking schemes certainly in Hounslow we only and Hounslow still only implement CPZs when the majority of people in a road or or a neighborhood support them that they're, they're never imposed unwillingly so and that does mean there is a time lag between the new developments that cause the problem but fund the cpz um uh being built and completed and occupied and and the residence parking scheme going in but by then there's such a problem caused by the parking of the new residents that the existing residents vote for it of course that then causes problems to uh, residents of the new blocks who uh, particularly in the shared ownership and social rent housing uh, if they require uh, mobility for work a car to be able to work and they didn't um, they, they they get used to being able to park on unrestricted neighboring roads and then they get stopped that there's a lot of pushback from that I, I don't know if there's an easy way around that and I also have a question for I think Dean but any of you could answer um, the statistics are uh, about support for low traffic neighborhoods um, and segregated uh, cycle paths and better walking um, and cycling facilities generally that the, the statistics seemed a bit kind of um, ambiguous or not necessarily particularly supportive do you, are you in are you or has anybody done a, a study uh, on views that compares um, the views of people within existing uh, low traffic neighborhoods or benefiting from uh, facilities against those who don't um, and to them it's more theoretical or a, a possibility for the future because my gut feeling is is that once schemes are in and people get used to them um, they they tend to like them it's very similar to people's initial opposition to residence parking schemes but I've never known support for removing an existing residence parking scheme so uh of things that I guess my first point to Alice and then um, um. Oh, 
thanks for asking that question. I mean, I, I've, I, I still find it, it strange uh, that flowers have this, and, and it is common, um, this policy where 50% uh, of households have to vote for controlled parking. It's not something that you have to have, as far as I understand, as a council. Um, it's, it's politics. So, it's, it's, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, <laughs> so, there's a very... So let's you know, get on top of it. So well, there are boroughs out there with yeah. 60, probably 60 out of 60 councillors in Newham, for example, who are Labour. You know, this isn't... No, no sorry, uh, sorry. It's not party politics. politics. within the party. It's, it's, it's not party politics. It's nothing to do with party politics. It's everything to do with... Uh, local representation you cannot yeah. impose stuff like that on, okay so on people. so okay so i think it's probably the only thing that i've ever heard of which uh, where we give a vote to people despite the fact that it has effectively giving people a referendum on something despite the fact that it has an absolutely massive impact on everybody's lives who don't have a car for a start that we don't hear the voices from them usually we don't actively seek the voices from the people who don't have a car and that actually it has a massive impact on a number of other. It's not just about whether somebody wants to park their parking their car in a road. It's about the impact that it's having on mode shift, the impacts it's having on short car journeys, the impacts having on pollution, on climate change, on road danger, everything. And so if you actually create a policy which reflects all of those things and not just what people want, then you know you would probably come up with a different policy. So I kind of feel personally quite strongly that those policies need to go basically in i think it, i think it was your statistics i was asking about um uh whether the or the, whether there's been a, a whether there is a difference of perception of active travel facilities depending whether they're already in or whether they're being proposed yeah, is that, was that to me? Um, so, uh, yeah, no, I, our, um, as I said, what we aim to do with the Walking and Cycling Index is to provide um, a measure at the, the level, the geographical level that reflects sort of strategic decision making. So, and to complement the evaluation of specific schemes. So, no, in, in this instance, um, it's not broken down by where there is a low traffic neighbourhood. We've actually got one, a, a colleague, that we're working with who's doing um, some um, some research using some of the data in that way and looking at low traffic where there are low traffic neighborhoods and the response is there um, but it's not something that we've done generally um, I think across the cities that we work with um, there aren't very many low traffic neighborhoods so that would be a much more specific um, ev evaluation of those particular interventions um, uh, obviously, there are far more in London. Um, there are a, a couple in Birmingham, um, not very widespread generally. So, um, uh, yeah, I think it's something that you know needs to be done more specifically. Um, although in London, you've got a better chance, and through the um, dashboard there. Um, just if I could pick up the question Mark from Mark Strong in the the Q and A because it does relate to that. Um, he was asking about, apart from Cambridge, all areas are unitary councils across the UK. Actually, the, um, the areas that we work with, they're, they're not necessarily all unitary. So some of them are um, city regions. So Greater Manchester, for example, and Liverpool city region. Um, they are uh, urban areas. We, we don't claim the data to be representative of the UK uh, as a whole but we are quite confident that it's pretty representative of um, larger urban areas across the UK, is what I would say. Uh, thank you. I mean, certainly, I mean, we, we discussed this briefly at the last APP meeting, but our anecdotal evidence of the, and okay, I am rather London centric, I guess, but um, my, the anecdotal evidence of, from the council elections in May, was that um, and and uh, was that and uh, um, certainly true in in Chiswick in the borough of Hounslow that um, the one party campaigned vehemently against them uh, and uh, the party that didn't say anything really about them um, uh, but was blamed for 
blamed by the activists for implementing them, um, actually, you know, won a seat. So, and then there's, there's some anecdotal evidence around the country that uh, campaigning against low traffic neighborhoods and cycle facilities and walking facilities, et cetera, um, doesn't actually do you many favors as, as a politician. And, and I, but I think particularly once they're in, and that was the beauty of um, gear change during pandemic because it meant things could go, uh, um, things that were taking forever and uh, uh, consulted on to the nth degree were put in as temporary measures to try them out. And um, so we, we got, you know, people, people got used to, to the, the much more peaceful um, neighborhoods and change, change their um, activities. I've got um uh, a question from um, uh, one of our peer uh, House of Lords members, George Young. Um, uh, was there a, the Sustrans slide he saw said 23% of my men cycled at least once a week. Is, is that actually correct? Um, yes, that's, yeah, he did read that correctly. It's, um, yeah, that is the result from uh, the survey. And sorry, who was being surveyed? I missed that. Was that was that a, a, a in national Mori poll or something, something like that, or was it? Um, it's a it's a, a survey. survey. Yeah, it's a survey that we commissioned. Um, it was run by uh, NatSen. Um, I can t summarize briefly the um, the methodology. So um, they take a, a, a random sample is taken of households from across um, the the city or city region, whatever area it is. Um, and sufficient to ensure that we get a sample of at least 1,100 um, respondents in each city, which then gives us confidence intervals of 3% either side, um, approximately speaking. So, um, but it is a survey that is designed as representative of all households um, in each of the each of the city's concerns. So, I mean, like I said, this survey was conducted um, last summer. So, um, uh, yeah, in fact, I think it was June, July, August. I think I, I'd said uh, July to September, I think it was June to August, but it was after travel restrictions were lifted. Um, so, yes, that did represent an increase from previous. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, we, from judging by some of the other figures, um, we hope that's because there are more leisure, people cycling for leisure now and fitness perhaps, rather than compared to, relatively speaking, compared to before the pandemic. Okay, um, Councillor Roger Hapford is asking, I think he's from Taunton, um, by the way, uh, who actually congratulated Cycling UK on the um, uh, BBR uh, initiative. But, um, uh, so, are the On Your Bike initiative. Um, and I suggest you might want to invite my chair, Selene Saxby, um, to see you. It's all the southwest, so I don't know what that distance actually means, but um, she may be very pleased to see you because she's also uh, has um, sort of rural towns in her constituency. Um, your um, how what size do you have as an urban area to implement schemes? Is there a size that makes schemes work? I think it means very much horses for courses. Any any of you want to? Um, come in on that particularly those of you with experience of um rural sort of rural large towns small villages oh, sorry large large villages small towns no okay um right um can i ask andy um, your statistics on equalities uh, and diversity looked quite impressive, but it looked like two thirds of your participants were decile four to ten, and only one if third we, were so were deciles one to three. It, is, uh, is, that, is that a good statistic or not? It, it varies year on year. So that, and that's just indicative of, of this year's programme. So that's sort of initial findings, really. I thought I'd give you our, our final reports to you at the end of the month. Um, but generally, it, it wavers around that. I can give you, let me just, I've got the sort of the previous data in front of me that I can give a bit more data on. But it is generally around that. It, 
so we've depending on how we deliver the program it changes year on year we've moved towards one of the things we're looking at is around how we um record the monitoring so as we alluded to the type of surveying that we're doing and moving to an online only system uh, that we had to through the pandemic meant that we think we're perhaps not reporting data back from certain the demographics that we need to we know we're working in those communities but it's getting the data back from that in terms of server responses we're getting case study type data back but yeah in terms of the um uh, quantitative stuff yeah it's um it has dipped ever so slightly so but it is generally around between around the average for our first five years program was about 40 percent coming from the first three deciles okay Thank you. Um, I think we probably ought to <coughs> wind up now. Um, I can't remember anything else. I've got a head into Westminster. Um, do, uh, do you each want to just say something quickly um, to sort of as a final parting uh, message? So um, I'll start with the order you spoke in. So I think that was Andy first. I'll go first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. Uh, I feel like our program reaches some of the areas perhaps with, uh, where there's less, you know, it's a behavior change program. So we're looking at those sort of initial journeys into wood cycling in terms of pleasure. We're keen to explore the links with infrastructure as more comes online after the, uh, for the implementation of local authorities. And that's something that we're looking to report on in the future. Um, we hope to continue funding through Active Travel England as it will be uh, for the next couple of years. But do get in touch if you have any more questions, of course. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I think that, you know, as a coalition, we just feel that the, the urgency is so great. The coalition, you know, believes strongly that we need what we call, you know, what the London Cycling Campaign uh, call climate safe streets. Uh, we need to tackle pollution. And so we really need strong action uh, from boroughs as well as the mayor of London. Um, and, and we are lucky in London. Um, but but really, we, we need those decisions to be made and um, and we need boroughs to be bold. We need councillors, politicians to be bold um, and to be communicating why these measures are are so badly needed. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I think I've touched already on what we're we're planning to do in future. But um, yeah, I think, you know, an, uh, an overview of what we've what we've done with Walking and Cycling Index was just to demonstrate that there is a broad um, majority of support for the type of interventions that we're, you know, that we're, we're advocating. Um, and I think you did touch on saying, oh, support below traffic neighbourhoods, maybe not quite what we would like, but it, nonetheless, it's still, um, I did go back to check the number, so 66% in favour and 12% against um, from the survey. So, um, Yes, it's it might. Sorry, I misread. Sorry, I mis must have misread the slide. No, it you know it might. The sixty six percent is a few points lower than last time, but that's you know it's still a, a massive majority. Um, so uh, yeah, and I think yeah, there's lots of evidence. Um, so it's about it's about compiling that picture um, in the ways that we're all doing um, and keeping uh, keeping it up to date and filling in um, you know more missing bits of the picture so it makes the. the the uh, case ever more convincing. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, there were some really useful things there. Um, I'm, uh, I'm sure we'll be sharing the slides with everybody. Um, I hope we've answered everybody's questions uh, between us, though I fear possibly not. Um, I think the messages I was seeing is support for the combination of both physical infrastructure and. Um, uh, encouragement, training, um, promotion, whatever you, uh, confidence building, all of those, the sort of the, the, the people side of it. Um, uh, Alice made a good point about local authorities, though there's a varied picture, as we all know, and local authorities are desperately strapped. And we've also got a shortage of um, expertise in a lot of local authorities. But um, we, we should have Chris Boardman, um, the new uh, Active Travel England Commissioner, coming to talk to us about, um, you know, his his programme, which I hope will begin to sort of tie these, all these elements together so that there's, and the sharing of best practice um, so that, you know, we can get more local authorities uh, going along the same paths as, as the best. Um, and... Yeah, I mean, it, you know, we're not going to get change overnight, but um, 
you know, enough small steps together make make up some big strides or some, some, <laughs> something like that. Um, okay, so thank you very much to all our speakers. Uh, thank you to Adam Kaufman for um, sorting, uh, um, sorting out the meeting today. And thank you to all um, participants. Uh, and I hope you found it useful. Thank you very much. And just to say Bye. the next meeting, the next meeting will be on the 12th of September. Um, more At information. Yeah. More information 12th of September, 4.30. Um, and we'll hope to be able to carry on doing hybrid meetings. We, we, I mean, we, we couldn't, there's no way we could have had a meeting in Parliament today, uh, apart from the fact I wouldn't have got there. Um, but uh, it will be that we'll have a room booking, but we'll also, we'll, we'll run it hybrid as well. So that'll be 4.30 on the 12th of September.